Okay, thanks, Alan, for this introduction, and thanks to the organizers for bringing me and us here. Um, so all this has been, over the years, joint work with um, Aurélien Garipier, right there, uh, Mesrop Oanessian, who is there, and uh, Elisabeth Garcia and Dominique Bontemps, who are far away. This is about lossless compression or over a countable alphabet. So I make a crash recall of lossless compression. So a lossless compression is just about mapping messages, that is sequence of symbols, from some alphabet. And here we will consider countable infinite alphabets uh, to code words, that is sequence of binary symbols, 0 and 1, so as to minimize the expected length of code words in a one-to-one -one way and in a non-ambiguous way. So we assume that there is a probability distribution over the set of messages. And the average is with respect to this uh, probability distribution that's also called the source. So asking for, oh, um, for a non-ambiguous non way, that is, we want not only that there is just uh, one message for one code word, but if you want to concatenate code words, to make a sequence of binary symbols, it should have a unique parsing into code words. And asking this just has consequences, and those consequences are summarized by the kraft macmillan equality. That is, if you are using a non-ambiguous code, that maps messages over binary sequences and that assigns a length that we call lambda to any uh, code word, f, f of omega, then the, the length of code words should satisfy this inequality. And this kraft macmillan inequality, this is an on, if and only if, just provides a bridge between two words, the words of non-ambiguous codes and the words of probability distributions over a set of messages. That is, any non-ambiguous codes defines a possibly defective probability distributions over the set of messages. And conversely, if you have a probability distribution, let's call it Q, over the set of messages, it defines a non-ambiguous encoding where the code word length is the so-called ideal code word length. This is, it satisfies the, almost satisfies the Shannon lower upper bound, uh, lower bound, sorry. That is, it is the binary logarithms of uh, the probability of the message up to one. So it can be fed to an arithmetic coder to provide an effective coding. <coughs> so equipped with that, we, we may say, well, if you know the source distribution, then you're in a good shape. You have an optimal encoding that can be further realized by a Huffman coding or feeding an arithmetic coder. But if you want a general purpose encoder, then you have to choose a coding probability, which may not be, and which is in general not the, the source distribution. Okay, and you have to pay for that. And the loss you suffer, this is the expected difference between the code word's length and the ideal code word length. So minus log of pxn and plus uh, uh, minus the, the log of the, uh, minus the ideal code word length. This reads as a callback libler, the KL divergence between the sampling probability, the source distribution, and the coding distribution. And then, if you have a collection of sources, call it lambda, over messages of length n, then you may, call, you may look at the worst distri source distribution with respect to your coding probability, and define the best coding probability, or look at what the best coding probability would give, and this defines the minimax redundancy over messages of length n against your class lambda. 
Conversely, you, you may play another game. You may put a prior on, uh, on the sources, so pi. Look at the expected redundancy of your coding strategy with respect to the random source you ch you've chosen. Look at the best coding strategy. And then look at the least favorable prior. And this defines the maximum redundancy. And in this setting, a theorem from, I think, David Osler uh, showed that the two coincide. So you have a strategy for getting lower bounds by playing with priors, and a strategy for getting upper bounds by cooking up nice coding strategies. OK. So uh, well, what is the role of the alphabet size there? What's special with looking at countable alphabets? Well, there are a host of cla classical results uh, for memoryless sources uh, with finite alphabet of cardinality k. Then almost everything is known about the minimax redundancy. And a series of works going from the 80s, 90s, tells us that then the minimax redundancy over that class of sources scales like this. It scales like the log of the message length. And in that way, with respect to the size of the alphabet. And if you want more precise results, you have to look at recent papers by Wojciech Spankowski and uh, Marcelo Weinberger. But well, we, we are not looking at more precise results. We, we want more flexibility. And another uh, good news about this uh, finite alphabet setting is that we have pretty simple, efficient, computationally and statistically uh, transparent coding strategy that achieve those bounds. So the krzyzewski trofimov uh, strategy, so this is a mixture coding that, that takes advantage of the conjugacy between Dirichlet priors and binomial counts and multinomial counts uh, gives you something which is asymptotically maximum and approximately minimax. So it achieved that bounds up to some constants. And that gives you an online coding strategy. So it's only based on counts. So if, you, if this is a number of occurrences of A, a symbol A in your, you have seen so far, the, the posterior probability of seeing an other A on the next symbol it's just that expression, and this is enough for filling your arithmetic coder. So you're in a very good shape as far as the alphabet is finite size, and you know the, the size of the alphabet. When you're looking at countable alphabets, well, then it's, it's, you get plenty of bad news. So in the early 90s, uh, Kiefer, Durfee, Pali, van der Meulen uh, got uh, negative results. So even if you forget about any uniformity. So if you are looking at sources over the integers, uh, then whatever your, uh, well, th there is this equivalent. I say, that if you have a coding strategy that for any source in your collection achieves a sublinear redundancy rate without any uniformity there on, on, on P, then you can do that if only if Actually, the, your, your collection of sources has a, a finite bounded uh, callback library radius. So you need to put constraints on your collection of sources if you want to have non-trivial minimax redundancy. Um, OK. So uh, there are different ways of getting out of this curse. There is the possibility of doing pattern coding that was uh, initiated by the San Diego group. Uh, but with uh, Aurelien and Elizabeth, we, well, we came later. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we worked on uh, trying to define things that would be appealing to all way statisticians. So we, we, we defined envelope classes, trying to put constraints so as to enforce some kind of compactness over the source class with respect to the weak convergence. So, uh, well, I, I put the definition there. You, 
We, we define an envelope function just as a, a function over the integers towards positive reals, so that the sum of the f functions is larger than one, but it's still convergent. And the envelope class, so the source class, is just defined by the first marginal. We're considering memorial classes, so it's OK. And uh, we just want the probability of a symbol to be la smaller than uh, f of x. And actually, this provided f decays sufficiently fast, this defines uh, tractable classes. And the, the richness of the class is actually well captured by the so-called envelope distribution. So you pick some L, and you define it at the f largest k, such that the sum of the fj is larger than 1. So it will define a, a probability over the, the, the large integers. And uh, f of k is the probability dis distribution uh, that we call the envelope distribution. This is the distribution <laughs> function. So the tail function or the survival functions will be denoted by uh, over line f. And actually, we borrow a shorthand from extreme value theory, which is really underneath uh, all the, this investigation. Uh, so u of t will be uh, a shorthand for the quantile of order 1 minus 1 over t, so t is something larger than 1, <coughs> of this uh, envelope distributions. And actually, the, the, com the minimax redundancy will be captured as a functional of, of u. OK, so uh, what kind of envelopes do we have in mind? Well, they, well, there are light tail envelopes and uh, AB tail envelopes. So the light tail envelopes uh, will be defined as by taking a smoothed version of the envelope distribution and assuming that it has a non-decreasing hazard rate. So this is very much like the log concavity question, log concavity uh, assumption that was used yesterday afternoon. And well, the hazard rate of a distribution is. Um, so if you take the density, it's the density divided by the, uh, the tail functions. And we assume it to be non-decreasing. So it's, it defines functions that are, say, that have lighter tails than uh, geometric distributions. The geometric distribution just lie at the, bound, at the boundary. So, for example, you can have exponential geometric envelopes or Poisson envelopes, all they fit in, or you can have a discretized versions of uh, absolute values of Gaussian, they, they would fit in, into this framework. So, in, in the parlance of extreme value theory, this is part of the Gumbel domain. Huh? Uh, and you have the, what we call the regularly varying envelopes or the max stable envelopes, okay, where you assume that the tail functions or the tail quantile functions are regularly varying with an index gamma, the extreme value index that is strictly positive, it means you have something that looks very much like a power law. Okay, uh, L is something slowly varying, and uh, they behave in a quite different way. So, to get intuitions about difficulty of adaptive coding, I, I will come to this. In, in a few minutes. Well, let's get bound on minimax redundancy for those uh, envelope classes. So we start with an old result with uh, Aurelien. So if you have a, an envelope class defined by its envelope distribution in this way, then you have an upper bound, which is often tight, but not completely tight, uh, that has the following uh, interpretation. So at the infimum over u, where you put u smaller than n, of a part of, say, the tail functions. And here you get an expression that recalls the minimax redundancy for coding over finite alphabets. This is a suggestion for a coding strategy. Actually, if the envelope is known, a good coding strategy consists in choosing a threshold that is the solutions of this equation, approximate solutions, 
all the symbols that are larger than the thresholds, all the peaks over thresholds, will be encoded with a general purpose, one size fits all code. For example, one of these alias codes, it's two times the, or a little bit more than the length of the binary expansion of the symbol. And all the others will be encoded using a, a good Krzyzewski Trofimov mixtures over alphabet of size the threshold. And if the envelope is not known, you need to look uh, for a data-driven threshold. So I just make an aparté about the lower bounds. So for getting lower bounds on minimax redundancy, well, there is a, you don't need really to go through Fano's lemma. You can use uh, the redundancy capacity theorems that say that this lower bound should be of the form of a mutual information between the parameters, something that parameterizes your sources, and the message for some uh, Bayesian game. And actually, uh, by playing on ad hoc priors that are tailored to the, to the envelopes, uh, you can check that there is a not so bad bound uh, that this uh, lower bound is not less than the expected number of distinct symbols in, in, in a message, which in turn can be uh, shown to be related to the solution of this equation, so which, which was given by the ideal threshold. But the, the, the best lower bounds are made in California, and <laughs> at least uh, with tools made in California. And so for light tail envelopes, uh, they have this form. So they were worked out using uh, by uh, Dominique Bonton, Elisabeth Gassian, and myself, using previous work by uh, gen very general work by David Osler and Manfred Hopper from the 90s. And you will see a function it has that shape, so it looks very much like what you get in the finite alphabet setting, but it extends to the older light, light tail uh, envelopes. For power low envelopes, our upper bounds are, are loose, and our lower bounds are not as good as the upper bound that were uh, obtained by uh, the San Diego group recently. And a nice, a nice picture of this. Uh, well, they, they, they've got very elegant proofs, uh, is that for Powell envelopes, uh, their upper bound has the same uh, shape and the same order of magnitude as our old uh, trivial uh, lower bound. Okay. So what are we doing with this? Uh, oh, sorry, I have to go back. Well, Actually, we don't know what the envelope is, and we don't want to assume too much about what the envelope. We just want to put size constraints, shape constraints, on the envelopes, so we get two flavors of adaptivity. Adaptivity is not really a buzzword in, in data compression, unfortunately. Uh, so we, we try to tell her what, got from, what we got from uh, iChur statistics. So there is the, the natural notion. So we would like a coding strategy that given a collection of envelopes of source classes does almost as well as the best as the tailor-made uh, coding strategy. So this one would be adapted to this source class. This one would be twice universal. This is feasible for light tail envelopes, for the collection of light tail envelopes. But for a massive envelope class, for max table or regularly, regularly varying envelope classes, we don't know. So we are happy to use this uh, downsized notion of adaptivity, say weekly adaptive, with a low slackness of order log n. So what are the coding uh, codes? The, the coding strategy that achieve that are really simple. They're all based on thresholding and censoring. So you take your and progressive censoring. So for the light tail envelopes, the strategy is really easy. You look at the largest symbol seen so far, so the last record. And if the next symbol is larger than this, then you will censor it. You will threshold it. 
So escape it by a zero and code it using a general purpose coder. And using the, the last symbol there, the, and for the, the good symbols, you use a Krzyzewski trophy of encoding for that. So I skip a little bit the examples and tell what we get. Then this very simple, computationally effective and conceptually simple strategy is actually completely adaptive. The minimax redundancy rate for uh, those light tail envelopes is actually as this simple nice form. And this is achieved by this uh, auto-censoring code, provided the envelope is, <coughs> you, you attack the non-decreasing hazard rates. And if you want envelope with heavier tails, then you have to threshold in a, in a different way. Because if you were using uh, this uh, simple thresholding strategy, the effective alphabet you're using would expand far too fast. You, you, then you, you would have a, a, a linear redundancy, which is exactly what you don't want. So you have to, to think that the thresholds you should look at should be solution of these equations, or it would be the same solution of this equation. And the solutions actually would capture the regular varying properties of your envelope, and you could craft um, an empirical threshold, the data-driven threshold, that will really mimic the behavior of this ideal threshold without being told about it. And then, using that, <coughs> you would achieve this, well, still frustrating results. Weak adaptivity, because, well, the minimax redundancy uh, is not less than this uh, strange threshold, strange ideal threshold. And the redundancy of this, uh, our censoring code uh, is not more than a constant number of this quantity that, goes like, that grows like a power of n times log n. Whereas the minimax redundancy, as shown by the San Diego group, has this order of magnitude, which is up to a constant, of this order. So we're off by a factor of log n. And I think I should stop here now. Uh, thanks. <coughs> Yes, I think it's the same notion. Uh, I mean, we went through the literature and saw this adaptivity as it is known in, in, uh, in non-parametric statistics, so following from the Russian school, um, didn't really catch up in, in this field of lossless compressions. So there is this twice universal coding or hierarchical university, uh, universality, sorry. Uh, at least there, there are several words and uh, several works on, on, on the several perspective. Um, but, uh, well, this, is, this has not been mainstream in, in, in lossless compression as far as I understand it. So the frustration here is we don't know whether, still, whether there's a price to, to pay for universality. So if you want analogies with uh, extreme value theory, Estimating this gamma parameter, you have to pay a price for universality if you don't know the so-called uh, second-order properties. This price is uh, less than a, than a log n. But uh, for this problem, I, I don't know if there's a reduction between estimating gamma. Do we need to estimate gamma to be, to be efficient or not? Or is there a weakness in our analysis? There are still open problems, and this is one of them. Is there actually a theory, or is it just regular invariant function show up here? Um, well, underneath there is a, I mean, for the, the nuts and bolts, there are uh, actually a, an interplay between concept from extreme value theory and uh, concentration of measure arguments. I think 
the nice thing is that for light tail envelopes, this uh, maximum symbol, the records, well, they, are, they fit into this concentration on two values phenomenon that shows up in combinatorics from time to time. This, this is because we have this non-decreasing hazard rate. So basically the maximum is, if you are more than the geometric, it's either some function of n or this function plus one. Okay? Like Morally. Like an average range. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I think that, that, that all comes from, from the same, same roots, a paper by uh, Clive Anderson from the 1970s. And on the other side, the, for, for, for general purpose envelopes, so EBITDA envelopes, uh, the threshold to so this uh, empirical analog of this small MN as the shape of, um, well, it's very nice to, to analyze it because it's, it behaves like a Poisson random variables. So it has all the desirable concentration properties we would like to have. So there, this makes the, the analysis less gory. <laughs> and that's it. But.